pull them aside and have some conversations. And they love that. That's where their heartbeat is. So we encourage you to do that over this weekend. So Catherine, come and share what God's laid on your heart. Can you hear me now? Ah, there we go. Okay. This is really nice. This is a delight. I'm privileged to be invited here. I'm excited to share the word of God with you. So let's just start with a word of prayer. Ah, Father God, I thank you so much that you've given us this time and this space to come before you. I ask that the distractions of the day and the concerns of our week and our families and um, our own struggles would be put aside for the moment and we would have ears to hear you and hearts that are open and I thank you that we know that your spirit is here that you have things to tell us and that you are going to take us where you want so I ask that you would guide us and that this would be a blessing to my sisters to your church and would glorify you in the name of Christ we pray amen well today we're going to be talking about image management let me make sure this works. Ah. So, today there is more pressure than there has ever been on women to create and manage an identity. We have a society that is plugged in 24-7. There's MySpace and Facebook and Snapchat and whatever new apps are out there that I'm not cool enough to know about. And most women who are under 40 have either an iPad or a smartphone or something that they are on every day. And there's this incredible pressure to create an identity that you present to people. You need to have the right interests. You need to like the right articles. You need to have pictures that are stylized in just the right way so you can present a certain persona to the world. And then on top of that, if anyone actually meets you in real life, you need to be that person you've been putting online for years. Um, I thought the best way to illustrate this would be to just tell you about, well, it's really a lot of women that I work with, but I'm going to call this person Mel, because it's easier to talk about one person, and it keeps people's identities secure, and <laughs> they don't have to worry about telling me things that I will talk about at a conference. Um, <laughs> so let's call this woman Mel. Uh, she came into my office, you know, young, young lady, 30, couple of kids. And she actually came because her doctor had told her to come and get some counseling. Because she had had just a host of physical problems and she couldn't figure out why. She had trouble sleeping, she couldn't really keep her food down, she wasn't able to really engage in life, she felt scattered. And then on top of that, there were these bizarre physical symptoms. Her arm would go numb for days and she wouldn't be able to use it. She would have um, lots of <laughs> intestinal problems. And the doctor said, you're very anxious. All of these symptoms are symptoms of anxiety and extreme anxiety. And she thought, well, that doesn't make sense because I don't have anything to worry about. I have a husband who loves me. I have two beautiful children. I'm happy in my life. And he said, well, go see a counselor. <laughs> <laughs> they still figure out what's going on. Um, and fairly quickly, what I realized is that she had just an obsessive concern about how other people saw her. Um, she would spend an entire day planning one photo to put on Facebook. She had to be in the right location, with the right outfit, with the right food or drink in her hand, with whatever it was. But she would spend a whole day worrying about it and then would obsess about who had seen it, did they like it, what did they do? It's a bit of an extreme example, but it's something that most of us and most of the women you minister to can probably relate with. It may not be that far, but it's the obsession with how does your house look before people come over, to the point that by the time they're there, <laughs> you don't even have any energy to listen to them or care for them. You're still worrying about the thing in the bathroom that wasn't quite tidied. And and so even if the women you care for don't have this extreme end of concern, there's this, this push for us to manage how people see us more than we can even be engaged with loving them. So let's start off by talking about what an image is, and then we'll unpack and get to what God says about it. 
So, an image is the opinion or concept of something that is held by the public. Now, there's two definitions of this, so we're actually going to run on both of them, but this is the first one. That seems a little abstract, so we'll talk about Tom's. So, Tom's, for those of you who don't know, are a shoe company, and you buy one shoe, and they give another shoe away to kids in need. And they have a very good image in society. They're seen as being ethical, caring for the poor. People like to support them, not only because it supports children in need, but then people know that you support children in need because you wear Toms. So <laughs> Toms has an image that is good, but that image that they have is something that's held by the public. So it's people who view Toms as being ethical. Whether they are or not, we don't actually know, but we believe they are. There's a different kind of identity, I mean image. Oh, before I go on, what they call that is virtue signaling. There's this whole buzz right now, I don't know if any of you track this stuff online, but it's this new phrase that's been coined, which is virtue signaling, which is when you like things or you make statements online, not because of anything except you want people to know that you are this kind of person. You support the poor, your, your community is one that you care about and you're involved in, and you're, you're giving out signals that you're a virtuous person. And all of this is embedded within a narrative. I wouldn't care that Tom's gives things to poor people if I didn't think that the world was a difficult, hard place, that there's lots of people in need and it's my duty to care for other people. And if you're a good person, you'll care for the poor. It's in that narrative that this image comes out. Well, there we go. So the second definition is a representation of the external form of a person or thing. So for example, a mirror. It is a representation of your external form, but it doesn't have a soul. It has no inner identity of its own. It's just a representation of you. Or if you play video games, you create a character, you kind of make it look like you, and in the video game world, it is you going around doing the things you want it to do, and it's your image in the video game golf, or whatever game it is. But this is a very different way of thinking of things, because in the first definition, who the actual person is, is held by the public. So you determine who I am. If I'm a good person, I only know that if you believe that to be true. In the second definition, I contain who I am. I am a thoughtful knitter, and you see that I'm a knitter, but it's just a reflection of the fact that that's what I actually like. Okay, so keep this in mind, because we're going to come back to this throughout. Okay, so hopefully you're already seeing the problem here. <laughs> we are constantly forced to initiate and manage public opinion of us so that we can maintain the reality we want to uphold. So, if I want you to think I'm a good mom, I have to constantly manage how you see me mothering, which is completely separate to whether or not my child actually needs discipline, affection, attention, whatever it is. I'm not concerned about what they need. I'm concerned about you viewing me as caring, as opposed to actually caring. Or I'm concerned with you viewing me as being intelligent and up on the latest data instead of actually being concerned for issues, and so that's why I'm researching things. So you have this drive that motivates so much action and behavior that has nothing to do with God, nothing to do with <laughs> love for our fellow man. It's just purely driven by a desire for people to believe who you are. And there are some people where they actually need other people to affirm their identity to that extent because they can't hold it themselves. They don't have the ability to maintain a belief of themselves as godly, kind, good, whatever, whatever you want to put in that spot if somebody else doesn't believe it. Or you're forced, and sometimes and, you go to the second definition, I hold my own identity, and it's my job to portray that to the world. Well, what if you don't know who you are? All of a sudden, you're forced to know who you are to represent that to the world. You have to figure out 
what your interests are. You have to figure out what your favorite movie is. You have to figure out what your thing is so you can put that out there and have people like it. But it forces this anxious introspection. So this inc creates an incredible amount of self-focus. It is a barrier to genuine human engagement because you're always trying to manufacture and maintain this image. And it creates an incredible amount of anxiety for an awful lot of women who either are you <laughs> or are under your care. Um. The other problem is that all of this exists within a narrative. So in our modern society, not only do we need to decide what image we want to portray, but what narrative we're going to have allegiances to. I read an excellent book. It is called The Many Altars of Modernity by Peter Berger. I would recommend it to those of you who enjoy reading. <laughs> um, the, the basic idea is that in your identity, there's two sections to it. There's a background to your identity and a foreground to your identity. The background of your identity are the things that are determined for you before you were ever born. Um, and you come into life and those things are stable parts of your identity that you have no control over. And in the foreground are the things you get to decide. Well, before the Industrial Revolution, so much of our identity was determined by the background. What your job would be, your station in life, whether or not you would get married, all of these things were already determined before you were even born. And you had a few things you could choose. You might get to choose your husband. You might get to choose, I don't know, where in town you would live. But there weren't a lot of choices. In modern society, you can have almost anything that you want if you have the resources to make it happen. But you can at least aspire to anything. Any career you can want, everyone tells you to go for it. Where do you want to live? Make it happen. Who do you want to be? So there, there's an endless array of options now, which increases our anxiety and the pressure to figure out who we are. And with all of these narratives, there's a ton of different ones you can attach yourself to. This is just like the tiniest sampling of them. I'm a good mom. I'm a global citizen. Nobody pushes me around. I'm not a doormat. Um, sometimes there's also the negative ones. I'm a loser. I'll never do anything. I don't have anything to hope for. And all of these are embedded within a narrative of this is who society is, this is what we're supposed to do, this is who I am within this overall picture. So, anxiety intensifies as we lose a sense of ourselves and image appears to be all that remains. As you live into this obsessive mindset, you lose any sense of actual stability in a firm identity, especially if you're a Christian in Christ, but even just as a human being. And all that's left is this outer exterior image and you end up feeling like there's this gaping void inside. So, there is a solution to this, so let's get towards that. There are three potential paths out of this quagmire. Before we actually go to the paths, um, I want to, as a brief aside, just mention that my focus here is meant to be for you as caretakers. You, uh, if you're here, it's probably because you have women that you're looking after. So my main goal here is to equip you to care for the women in your lives who have these struggles. That said, I would encourage you to think of it for yourself as well. If we're going to help other people, we need to see these threads in ourselves and be able to bring them to the Lord, know how to work through them. Otherwise, your ability to offer them to other women is going to be much, much smaller because you don't have a sense and a feel for it yourself and you haven't felt why do you do that? What, what does that feel like? You can't resonate, you can't be fully compassionate with the other person. So I'd encourage you to try to find that line in yourself, even as you're thinking of it for the women underneath you. So if someone comes to talk to you about this problem, they lay out all these struggles, and then you ask them, so what advice have you gotten so far? You know, I'm probably not the first person you've talked to. What have other people said? Well, often, one thing that people have heard is, your image doesn't matter. Just focus on God. 
Stop all this fussing about image. Just go focus on God and it'll take care of itself. Unfortunately, (laughs) God is incredibly interested in our image. Maybe I should say fortunately. The solution seems to miss the fact that if we are going to focus on God and the things he cares about, we're also going to have to focus on image. God talks an awful lot about our image in scripture. So yes, this obsessive focus is ungodly, unrighteous, wrong, but if we throw the baby out with the bathwater, we're missing a really good gift of God's. This is often known as pietism. Second path, um, the other answer that women get a lot of is, your image is good, be content with it. Don't worry about it, don't fuss over it. You're just fine the way you are. Again, this misses an integral theme in scripture where God says, I love you, but you're not okay the way you are. Your image is very flawed and very marred and you need to be working on changing and growing that image. If you want to read more about this, David Paulson has an excellent article called God's Love Better Than Unconditional. I would recommend you read it. It is very good. Is this a particularly tricky answer because it is partly true? Because God does love us? Because God does accept us? But he desires more for us than what we are when we come in to his family. He wants us to grow and change. And that's on almost every single page of the Bible. <laughs> so, um, By the way, we are not talking about bodies right now. I think it's easy when we talk about image to try to get that mixed with bodies because that's what people see when they talk to us. And God does care about our bodies, particularly, particularly bodies that give us an experience of shame when we're in front of other people. When we feel shame over who we are because of how we are seen, that can really tie into this topic, but it's a little separate. But briefly, because this is something dear to my heart, <laughs> I do want to say God's response to people who have bodies that cause shame in them is one of compassion. I think my favorite example of this is Leah. And for those of you who don't know the story, uh, Jacob ran away from home after stealing his brother's birthright, saw Leah's younger sister Rebecca, fell in love, worked six years to marry her, and then his father-in-law tricked him. And at the wedding night, he was married to Leah, woke up the next morning, found out it wasn't Rebecca, (laughs) and was very, very discouraged, very disappointed, very upset. Leah, of course, it was horrible. She was married to a man who didn't want her, who scorned her, and in scripture she's described as having weak eyes, which means she was not a good-looking woman. She was not a handsome lady. And throughout the rest of the story of Leah, you see God's compassion for Leah. He gives her 10 sons, which is amazing in ancient culture, to have 10 sons who all lived. It's phenomenal. So God honors her, and if you read her story, you see her growing contentment in the Lord's blessing. But that's just a brief aside. So if you have women under you where their struggle with image is primarily about how they're seen, God's response to that is compassion, love, and care. But we're not going to talk about that today. So the third path, which is not the pietistic path and not the therapeutic path, which is my name for that second path, is the Imago Dei, the image of God in us. So with this path, you bear an image instead of creating an image, and instead of managing an image. So over the next little while, we are going to consider the image of God, how it was first given to us in Adam, and what that meant, how it was fully revealed and offered in Christ, and how we are God's image-bearing avatars. Finally, we'll talk about how we can do this and how it will solve the problems of self-oriented, anxiety-producing, and people-alienating image management. So let's start with the image of God in Adam. If you want to read here or turn in your Bibles, that is Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. It should be familiar to you all. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. 
So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So what does it mean to bear an image rather than create an image? So who knows what this is? It's an idol, um, generally. I think it's Shiva, but it's an idol. So in ancient times, when Genesis was written, all the cultures around them had idols. They had what scripture often calls graven images. And the way that idols would work is, at the time, there was this understanding of reality that there's a spiritual world all around us. And that world can't really interact with this world, they can't see it, but there's these nexus points where that reality can kind of come into this reality. And the idols that they would create would be these nexus points. And, but there were certain things you had to do for these to sort of be portals that could be opened up. So they had their idol, but you had to wash it, sometimes in blood. You had to sacrifice things to it. You would dress it and clothe it. I actually went to a Hindu temple when I was in Philadelphia. It was really, really interesting because there's all these idols around the room and the priest is there and he's washing the idol and people are bringing food and praying to the idols and you know, they're wearing clothes that they got put in that morning. So there's, there's rituals that you have to perform for these idols to become a gateway. They have the potential, but you have to do these things. And then the spirit from the spiritual world can come and fill the idol. And certain things would happen. You could, um, often people would have documents and contracts that they would sign because the thought being, if you don't follow through, the idol will come and enact whatever the horrible punishment is for not fulfilling your contract. Or you would beg it for prosperity and fertility and good travels and whatever the case may be. But you had these graven images that would be filled with these evil spirits and allow connection between the spiritual world and the, spirit and the physical world. Scripture loves to point out the paradox in idols that on the one hand they're nothing, they're just stone and wood and there's nothing to them. But on the other hand, they're empowered by evil and darkness and demons and they are these like gaping holes that just suck in like life and goodness and res return with nothing. There's an inherent bargain in, a, in covenanting with idols, which is I will worship you and offer you sacrifices and then you give me what I want. It's interesting that in the Israelite religion, there is no graven image of God. God explicitly commands there is not to be any idols of him made. And if you remember, he gets a little annoyed when they try to make one out of a golden cow. <laughs> it does not go over well. <laughs> God kind of gets a little upset. He is not interested in any graven images to represent him on earth. Instead, he made Adam. Adam is the workmanship of his hands. Adam is formed out of the dust by God himself. God doesn't have people shaping wood into an image of him. God made his own image in us to represent him here on earth. We have these, this push, as I mentioned, with that second definition of image to determine your own identity, make something of yourself, um, what, what is that if not making a god out of yourself? I need to determine my identity. I am capable of saying who I am and having all of you agree that this is who I am. And what sacrifices have you, have you offered to your identity? What things have you slaughtered, destroyed, so that the identity you want to create of who you are can be realized. So Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say that you must not eat from any tree in the garden? 
The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. For me, it really jumps out when Satan says, if you eat this, you'll be like God. And the woman says, that sounds pretty good. I think I would like to be like God. And then she eats the fruit. After this, you see the exile out of the garden. Adam and Eve are sent out. They're alienated from God. You can see it as they sow the fig leaves. There's a sense of distance and shame. And the overall feel the overall emotion of both of those things is the emotion of fear. There's this underlying fearful, anxious current that comes with exile and alienation, which is what we all are born into, what our society cannot help but spew everywhere <laughs> because we have all been exiled from God. We are all alienated from God, and they do not have any solution for that. So grasping equality with God leads to alienation and, anxi and anxiety. And if you go back and think about Mel, who we spoke about at the beginning, that was her experience. She felt so alienated, not only from God, but from other people. She felt anxious in presenting herself to friends, family, strangers, because there was this deep-seated sense already of, I'm out, I can't get in, I'm always on the outside and I'll never be able to push past those barriers. We've ejected the background data. You know, remember Berger, the foreground and the background of identity? Well, God gave us a background of identity. He told us who we are, he told us who we're meant to be in scripture, but we've ejected that, and we've attempted to create our own narrative. So, we come to Christ, thankfully, and he would be able to bear his own image, right? Like we. We can't bear God's image, but Christ could bear the image of God. He is the image of God. Colossians 5, I think, 1. Colossians 1, 15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So he could bear the image of God, certainly. But Jesus surprises us, as he always does. Let's turn to John chapter 8. No? Am I not doing that? Hang on. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. Verses 6 to 11. So Christ, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage and grasped. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So Christ is God. He is fully capable of bearing his own image. He did throughout all of eternity before time began. And yet, his heart attitude is not to grasp equality with God. He doesn't grasp being God. He humbles himself. He's the only one who could have, but he chose to put that aside. He chooses instead to be a conduit of God's desires, led by God's spirit, and fully participate in bearing the Father's image instead of his own. Now let's go to John chapter eight. So they were saying to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. They did not realize he had been speaking to them about the father. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And He who sent me is with me. 
He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. And then you skip down to verse 54. Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. I love this chapter of scripture. This might be my very favorite chapter in the whole Bible. You get these two beautiful things held at the same time by Christ. On the one hand, it is his strongest personal statement of his identity. He says, I am. I am. I am God. I am. He's, he has his identity. There's none of this needing people to believe it, needing to figure out who he is so he can represent it to other people. He just is. He is God, and he bears the full weight of that deity on himself. And yet, you see the interplay of the Trinity in the most amazing way. The Father glorifies the Son and never leaves him alone, and he knows his Son. Michael Reeves did an excellent job in his talk yesterday, talking about the Father's affection that continually pours out on his Son. And that's what the Father does. He pours his affection. And then the Son knows the Father. He says the things he's learned from the Father. He does what's pleasing to the Father. And he submits his, his will in every way, doing nothing of his own initiative. And that's the piece where he has this image, but he doesn't grasp it. He doesn't hang on to it and say, yes, I am God. I make my decisions. I say what I want. You're going to know who I am. Instead, he puts all that aside, and he does only the will of the Father, constantly and continually. So, I am sure everyone here has drawn the line between the intellectual dots, but I just want to make sure it lands. So, we are the avatars of God. We are the idols that God shaped with his own hands. We are meant to be these nexus points between the spiritual world and the physical world. And if these certain rituals are performed, the spirit of God will be on us. And what are we if not bathed in God's righteousness, covered with his blood, put on robe, covered in robes of righteousness, and filled with the Holy Spirit? We are meant to be the, the object which brings the spiritual world of the Holy Spirit into reality on the earth to do the will of God. That is who we are. I'm not a good mom. I'm not a nice lady. I'm not a thoughtful cosmopolitan. I am the image of God. And it moves all of our attention and our concerns away from how people see us and who they think we are. And it brings you to the very moment you're in and you say, what does God have for me in this moment? What am I supposed to do in the next five minutes? I'm not worried about tomorrow. I'm not worried about yesterday. Right now, I'm currently the image of God. I'm currently moving forward as God in this world. That's my job. So, you may be saying, isn't that going a little far? Are we going a little beyond the bounds of scripture here? It seems a little intense to say that you actually are the body which God fills, and you do things in this world. Well, the Pharisees had the exact same reaction, so let's go see what God said to them. In John chapter 10, verses 31 to 39. So the Jews picked up stones to stone him, being Christ. Jesus answered them, I show you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law, I said you are gods? 
If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you don't believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand the Father is in me and I in the Father. Therefore they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. So here Christ is quoting from Psalm 82, and he's telling the Israelites, in Psalm 82, God is telling the Israelites that even though they are gods and sons of the Most High, they're going to die because they aren't being obedient to God. So even though this is what they are, he's still going to crush them. That's what's happening in the Psalm. But Jesus refers back to that to say, you're calling me a blasphemer because I say I'm the Son of God. You don't even know who you are. You are all meant to be gods, which I don't actually like that translation. I like more the translation of images or idols because we, we have a very limited vocabulary in English. <laughs> and so there's this difference between, so taking that more to mean the idol as opposed to the spirit which fills the idol. But that is what we are. So Jesus says, you're calling me a blasphemer for saying I'm that. You're all supposed to be that. You don't even know who you are. And yes, I am that, and I'm more than that. But for us, if we feel like we're overstepping by saying that we are supposed to be the avatars of God in this world, then we haven't understood scripture from the beginning. I think it's also interesting to go back to um, Genesis. Some scholars have said that the tragedy of Adam is not... Um, I don't know how to say that. It, let me put it this way. The tragedy of Adam is that when he ate the fruit, he already was like God. It was a lie from Satan that he wasn't like God. And there, the passage in um, verse 22, it says, God said, the man, now often people interpret this as um, was like us. Oh, no, no, the man is now like us, but the Hebrew is actually pretty, it's a word that it means a time, but you can translate it either way. And lots of scholars have argued that how it's actually translated is, the man was like us, capable of knowing everything ranging from good to evil. And doesn't that make sense that now all of our human problems come from the fact that we call evil good and good evil? That man had that capacity, and that's the great tragedy of the fall, is that that is what we were made to be, and they were already in it, but Satan truly lied to them and said you would be like God, and then they fell. You don't have to actually agree with me because that, <laughs> that point is sort of a, a pleasant addition to the rest of these other passages. Um, but our anthropology has been overly influenced by a heavy-handed application. Oh, well, let me see. Nope, too far. Our anthropology has been overly influenced by a heavy-handed application of the doctrine of total depravity. We are completely depraved, but because this is our experience in the world, we feel like, well, this is normal humanity. This isn't normal humanity. When we don't have a high enough estimation of who we were meant to be in Christ, that actually drops our estimation of God. Because if we consider ourselves to be like the moon, who reflect the glory of God back out, if we have a higher estimation of man, that actually means we have a higher estimation of God, because the sun must be brighter if the moon is brighter. So when we say, I think actually who you believe you are in Christ is less than what God intended us to be, that shows us how glorious God is, which is a, a piece of doctrine that I personally love. As a side note, if you want to research this more, go through scripture and track the theme of anointing. And when something is anointed in scripture, it's meant to be a vessel for the Holy Spirit. And this is what we're talking about, being vessels for the Holy Spirit. So go through scripture, read about the temple, read about David and the kings, and track the theme of anointing. And you'll get lots of fun stuff. So, let's summarize this third path of the Imago Dei. We become consumed, as Christ was, with being the vessel of God. 
we step into this dance of the Trinity, which is one of self-sacrifice, focus on Christ, serving, worshiping, and actively living out the identity of God. It's not something that you can think about and learn about and that will just help you grow. That kind of points you in the direction, but you're not gonna actually grow in this if you're not in, in it doing it. It's like a muscle. You can read all about muscles, but that's not gonna give you big muscles. <laughs> you have to actually go and do things with your muscles. So this is the same thing. Actively being in the present, prayerfully engaging as God's active hands and feet is what helps you grow in this. So, when you get to the piece of anxiety, what else is this active care if not love? It's love. Loving God and then loving other people. Our love for God allows us to push aside the things in us that are self-absorbed and consume our attention and our thoughts. And that creates the space for us to love other people because then all of a sudden as those things are pushed aside, the spirit of God is in us and we are flowing outward in love to other people. So your image does declare your allegiances. Your image being how people see you, how you present yourself. It says, what do you value? What do you love? Whose side are you on? It does declare those things. So embrace that and say, I am going to, with who I am in every moment, be the image of God. So how do you actually do this? <laughs> That's usually the really tricky part. Lots of times it's easy to get women in your ministry on board with the idea of, oh, I could put aside anxiety and be an incredibly powerful spiritual being used by God to fill the world with the goodness of light. Yeah, I'm on board. <laughs> it's not hard to get women to buy into the idea, but how do you actually help them do it? The first step is that you need to help them remember that this is who they are. Women often forget <laughs> that this is their actual purpose in the world. It's so easy to be consumed with the daily tasks, with the pressure from society and family and friends to be a certain way or have a certain emotion. We forget that this is who we are. And so you need to help remind them. Ask them the existential questions. Do they even have a framework for thinking about these things? Maybe you need to go through and be like, hey, look at these biblical passages. This is who you are, and, and honestly teach them. You could do that in a formal way and have a Bible study and say, we're gonna study anointing in scripture. What does that mean? Or you can just sit down with them and say, you know what, let me tell you about what I've been learning. This has been really fruitful for me. And then if you have a woman you're caring for who probably wouldn't come to a Bible study, you can still offer a vision to them that they can find at least intriguing, even if they can't imagine how they could live into it yet. You notice I did all R's? I thought that was fun. I like alliteration. <laughs> and I'm a good Baptist, so I did all R's. Um, the second thing is they have to risk. Because if you're gonna do this, you have to put aside the things that currently hold them. You have to put aside the anxiety. You have to put aside the obsession and the fear and, and the hope that you can have people love you and look at you and respect you and all the things that undergird their hopes. So you have to risk, you have to try something new. That in itself is a lecture, which is what I will be doing in my workshop. So <laughs> I'm sorry to leave you hanging, but it's too much to pack into one section. So if you wanna know how to help women risk, come and we'll talk about it later. The third one is you have to restore your, the woman or yourself to the original purpose. So this goes to what I was saying in actively act, acting out this reality. There's no just learning, just thinking, you do it. You can get really practical with women and help them do it while they're with you. Pray with them in the moment and then ask them, so right now, what's one thing you could do? In this very moment, what is one thing you could do for God? What do you think God is leading you to? They're like, I have no idea. You're like, that's okay. If you don't have any idea, then you just keep asking God. And then give them an example from yourself, which is where we get to you need to do this first before you get other women to do it. So you give them an example for yourself. Say, you know, I was at home, and I thought, well, I don't really know what I should be doing, and I feel overwhelmed by my day, and all I can think about is the 10 things on my list, and it's actually kind of crushing me. <laughs> and you're like, but then I really did 
refocused my thoughts. I prayed, and I said, Lord, what, what am I supposed to do right now? And I realized all the things on my list I couldn't get to until 9 o'clock anyhow. And my son was sitting at the table eating a sandwich, so I sat down beside him, and I asked him what he was thinking about. And that's what God had for me right then. That was what I could do in that moment. And so you move it away from obsession about the future, concern about everybody on the outside, and like in this very moment, how can I be used by God? How can I be directed by God? Instead of even anxiety about how all the ways that I've been a horrible mother has damaged my son, I'll just actually sit with him and, and be with him. Because it's not about his impression of me, it's about me being present with him. So you have to push them to actively do this. The fourth one is to reimagine. I think part of our problem is that our conception of Christ is so rigid and is often so small that when we are told, be Christ, we're like, I don't know what that means. Or I do, but it's, it's pretty condensed. Like it, it doesn't have a lot of richness. Your imagination doesn't go wild with it. So you need to expand that. Um, let me just see here. There we go. Can you see that okay? So these are just a smattering of who Christ is that you, I would encourage you to spend time actively, maybe you take one a day and say, what would it mean for this aspect of who Christ is to be lived out by me today? So Christ is a king. He's a builder, a priest, a prophet, a sage, a teacher, an itinerant, a healer, a contemplative. He is bread and water and wine and light and life. He's the abused one. He's a friend of sinners. He's a refuge. He's a stranger. He's one who was scorned and abused. He's a dinner guest and a host. He's a controversialist and so much more. So take these pieces of identity and explore what would it mean for you to be those things as Christ was. And there's a whole lot more in scripture. But our understanding of who we are has to be an extension of who Christ is. We can't be building it off of ourselves. Now, and all of this creates the background. If you're like, this sounds like I wouldn't be me anymore, that's the foreground stuff. There is still those things where it's like, you know what, if you're more sporty or you're more, I don't know, you like crafts, that's okay. That's who God made you to be, but that's not the, s the sure footbed of your foundation of your identity. And if nobody knows that you like football, it doesn't matter because you don't need to be seen as the football girl. You can just be somebody who's with them, listening to them, and caring for them. And sometimes it's caring to talk about yourself because they want the human interaction. <laughs> it, it actually helps the community when you're open and you share your flaws and you share your struggles. But when, even when you do that, it's because you're actively engaging as Christ did. And the final step is that you need to model it. You can't be telling women or encouraging women to do these things if you yourself haven't done it. If you yourself aren't present with them and listening and attentive and engaged in what's happening in the moment, they're never going to trust you <laughs> or try it when you tell them this is going to be good, this is going to be fruitful and life-giving. You're like, well but it's so hard you're not even doing it. So how on earth am I supposed to do this really hard thing if, if you can't do this? And you're supposed to be the one giving me advice. <laughs> so actively living it out is gonna be not only a source of encouragement to the women, but you'll actually be building the church because all of a sudden the spirit of God will be present and flowing out. So let me just close in prayer. Ah, oh, Father God, I wanna thank you for your spirit. I thank you that you have made us to be your image on earth, that instead of some body of stone, you have made us to be your body of flesh. And um, Lord, we're, we're fallen and we do not always see how to do this, but God, you say that you will lead us and you will guide us and you have given us your spirit. So I ask that this would be an identity that we can embrace and that you would give us a vision for how to offer this to the women who we care for and who are in our church. So I ask that you bless the women this day and that you would give them fruitful conversation and that your spirit would give them clarity of mind. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.